So epidemiologists are the people who work in the background to prevent disease and uh, produce the information we need to inform policy to keep people safe um, and safe from harm and safe from disease. And it's only been with COVID that the work that epidemiologists do have come to the fore, but I think most of us are most comfortable sitting um, in the background, quietly doing our jobs and behind our computer screens or in meetings and analyzing data. Um, and doing analysis to inform those, uh, those questions. My name is Megan Call, and I'm a joint lead epidemiologist working in the COVID-19 epidemiology cell for the UK Health Security Agency. So I started by getting a degree in nutritional sciences, and I knew I wanted to work in health, in the health-related fields, Initially, I thought maybe I'd like to be a doctor or a nurse, uh, but then I got really interested in um, looking wider at the population and then broadening out into public health. So I saw an, a job advert come up to work in national government, uh, working in national HIV surveillance, and that was really tempting to me because it pulled together all the aspects of policy and research and science in order to have a wider impact uh, on the whole population. Uh, and so that was really the start of my journey into public health and working at uh, UKHSA. One thing that I really like about working in public health is the opportunity to uh, have an impact and work in a very applied way. So the work um, that we can do ranges everything from national surveillance, to doing research and running trials, um, to working on incident response uh, and it, to emerging infections. So there's such a wide span of things that, that you can be involved in and types of ways that you can have an impact. And that's always been um, really um, the main draw for me in working in this field. So one project uh, that I've worked on that was really interesting was the Changing Perceptions Project. So as part of my work as an epidemiologist with UKHSA, um, I set up and ran an HIV patient survey um, with about four and a half thousand people with HIV. And what we did with that data afterwards is we uh, engaged with uh, the community, the HIV community, to get their feedback on what we should do with this data and what it meant to them and how it could fill the gaps in, in their sort of um, understanding and the data that they needed to do their work. So we set up workshops um, with um, a number of people living with HIV um, who volunteered. It was led by a person with HIV um, and we um, uh, identified key areas uh, and topics that were interesting for them. So for example, we looked at stigma, we looked at mental health, we looked at um, met and unmet needs, and we developed this suite of reports with and for people with HIV um, in order to uh, be able to inform some of the work that HIV policy organizations do. The, the graphic designer was a person with HIV, um, and it was, they were widely received and, and um, promoted by HIV organizations. That, those analyses and that data made such a huge impact because there was such big buy-in from the community. So it wasn't uh, us in our ivory towers, you know, deeming fit to give data down to the people below. It was absolutely hand in hand with the groups of people who would actually be using it. So not only did we have a lot of satisfaction in actually producing data that we knew would be used um, to advocate for the needs of people with HIV, but those groups also were able to ensure that their needs were met and they were able to um, inform how we looked at that data, the language we used, and the types of different um, analysis that we provide to do their work. So that was a really interesting project because it, it, I think, was very impactful and just showed how important that community participation and community engagement involvement is in the work that we do within UKHSA. So I started an account on Twitter, mainly just to, um, 
follow other people that I work with. Uh, with and people working in the sector, mainly the HIV sector at that time, and largely just to stay abreast of sort of what the current hot topics were, um, people live tweeting conferences and things like that. So I was kind of very much lurking in the background. Um, but then at the start of this of 2021, when uh, we were having a sort of the alpha wave vaccines were were kind of coming out and I was just seeing so much misinformation or uh, misinterpretation of, of the data that I knew so intricately well. And it was really frustrating to see that. And so essentially, I just thought I can help explain things and I can help people to understand what this data means what its limitations are, what you can and can't say um, from this, and uh, just really trying to decipher what was pretty complex material at times into plain lay language. Why do you think you blew up on Twitter? I think, personally, I think that my profile um, picked up on Twitter because there aren't that many people uh, working in government directly on the COVID response who are vocal um, on Twitter. And I think that's probably for several reasons. I mean, um, not only as civil servants, of course, we have to adhere to the civil service code and, and um, make sure that we don't overstep anything like that. But also, many people are not willing to understandably expose themselves to what is a very heated and difficult topic. So I think um, I think that that's probably just a scarcity thing. There weren't that many people who had the insider information or the insight who were out there uh, on, in the public domain speaking off of, you know, um, press conferences. So I started working on COVID-19 in March 2020. Um, I managed to not get called into the response straight away um, uh, because I was writing up my PhD, but then it uh, very quickly became all hands on deck and everybody had to pitch in and contribute. It was really fast paced, really um, hectic, to be honest, trying to bring together all the different fragments of information um, and build the picture of what was happening with COVID on a daily basis. So I started by working in the EpiCell. Uh, we came in on a, on a sort of volunteer basis and we did 12 hour shifts, two to three days in a row, and then went back to our, our day jobs. Uh, and at that time, my main role was to help set up our uh, COVID mortality surveillance. So that's counting deaths within 28 days or 60 days of a COVID diagnosis. And none of us had worked um, on that level before. Previously, um, with most other surveillance systems with HIV, we produced data tables four times a year, and now we were doing it on a daily basis. So there was a lot of pressure to be able to um, produce these statistics for the people who needed them, for decision makers, for the public uh, on a daily basis that were uh, as accurate and up to date as possible. Um, at the very start, we were getting numbers of cases through um, by emails and by phone calls and um, and tr trying to cobble them together into uh, you know a final number and deduplicate because you get multiple reports for each person. So that was the main pressure at the very start and to be able to put that out um, uh, in a rapid manner. So we had daily cadence um, every hour. There was a new um, task and a new output that we had to do. So it was very, very high pressured, very fast paced. Um, but it was also very exciting because we knew that we were working on something that was really impactful and really meaningful and uh, really had the eyes of the nation on the numbers that we were doing. I think one of the biggest accomplishments from uh, UKHSA over the pandemic has been the production of the um, COVID-19 dashboard, where we're able to provide a uh, a huge array of statistics and data um, on this um, platform, which is open source and is accessible to the public. 
Um, I think a, a, an upshot of that is it has meant that people can access the data themselves, they can do their own analysis, and they can um, try to understand the data to help inform their own decisions and what they need to do. With the, that data coming out, with that transparency, opens um, UKHSA up to criticisms and challenges from members of the public, from scientists, um, how accurate these data are, and whether it's the full complete picture, um, people always wanting some more data. Um, and so it's been very difficult, I know, to try and balance all the demands that are constantly being made and make sure we're also producing what we're doing now at a very high standard. I think one of the main highlights from the pandemic um, is the spotlight that it's shown on the UK scientific uh, capacity and capability and the expertise that we bring in uh, many different areas of, of science and research. So, for example, vaccine development um, and genomic surveillance, um, even the work that we've done on the dashboard to make data as transparent and open as possible. And I think rightly light has been shown on all of those capabilities, which we have um, for a long time um, built up it, uh, within the UK and have really come into their own now. So I think that's a big positive from the pandemic. One area uh, for learning for us is how we would respond to future pandemics if they crop up. Uh, in this pandemic, we built much of our policy around protecting the health and uh, social care sectors, which are absolutely crucial. And it's been um, vital that we protect the, the work of the NHS. But we have also seen the impact that it's had on many other sectors, including education, um, including people's employment um, and people's overall well-being. Um, and I think it's there's been times when inequalities have been exacerbated um, unintentionally, perhaps. So I think one thing that we can do going forward in planning for anything that happens in the future is trying to make a whole, more holistic um, approach to how we approach, how we deal with um, future pandemics um, and measures that might be taken as a result. UKHSA has only been around since October, so it's really in its infancy. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of positive things that we can do as an organization going forward in terms of responding to new and emerging health threats, in terms of um, it providing really uh, up-to-date and cutting-edge research um, and um, informing government policy. I think a lot of the structures that have been built and enhanced through COVID will be brought forward into the organization um, and make us an even stronger um, uh, lever for policymaking and being able to um, keep people safe from disease and prevent um, infections. So I think there's a lot of expertise that's been built up and a lot of um, powerful um, um, data that's been created that I'm hoping that we'll take forward in, in the new organization. How does it feel like to be like called rock stars of like the <laughs> pandemic these days? Because it must be kind of cringy. The first time I saw somebody say that epidemiologists were the rock stars of the pandemic, it was just blew my mind because before COVID, people didn't even know what I was. If I said epidemiologist at uh, you know the Christmas table, people thought I worked on skin or armadillos or something. They didn't even know what I did. So it's been a real shift that even people know what my job title is. Um, I think it's cool and I think it's exciting that people know what we do. Um, and it's a, kind of unfortunate it took a pandemic to, to show everybody that. But yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping that we can um, retain some of our rock star status going forward. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>